You're listening to Church Unlimited Sermon of the Week online. For more information, please visit our website or our church app. We trust that you'll be blessed by this message from Louis Nell. Good morning. Just want to greet those who are, are joining us on social media this today. You are so welcome, so wonderful to have you with us. Last week, we had the handover of, of, the, of the eldership team here in Nelspreit, the handover from, from Alan to, um, to Rudolf. It was a, an exciting time that is, is ahead for us as a church. It's a, it's a time of change. Alan is still leading the team, so just in case you haven't been here yes, um, last week and you're still worried about that, Alan is still leading the, the full CU team. But Rudolf has taken over the, the eldership team, the leadership of the eldership team here in Nelspreit. Last Sunday evening, one of the words that came out while they were, were praying was that there's a, a new season. And I believe that with this change in, in leadership, God is bringing us as a church into a new season. But it's more than just a season for us as a church. I believe God is, is bringing us as individuals also into a season. And this is a season where we as a, as a leadership team are very excited about. We, we have this expectation that God is going to do something new. God is going to do something great. There's an expectation of more of the power of God. There's an expectation that the kingdom of God will advance. This is the expectation. There's such an excitement, especially amongst the elders at this stage, of what is God going to do and is, He is busy doing. But this change, this new season that we as a church is walking into, I believe is not only for us as a church, but is also for us as individuals. And this morning, I would like to talk to us as individuals to see what it means practically to go into this new season. It's a, it's a big topic. So i just going, going to touch on a, on a rough number of things. And what I would like to do is I want to use the seasons in nature like a, like a parable and, and connect that with a spiritual season that, that I believe that we as a church as, and as individuals are walking into. So just as an overview... When we talk about the season of autumn, spiritually it, it, it speaks to those things that we need to let go, things that need to fall off. The old needs to die and fall off. Winter time speaks of a season where we, where we persevere, where we are, are resting and awaiting the new things of God. Spring, obviously, is new things, new life. And summer speaks about uh, a great effectiveness, speaks about fruitfulness. So those are the, are the four seasons. This, this morning, I would like to focus a little bit bigger on, on two of them. As I was preparing, uh, I felt there's an emphasis on, on autumn especially, but also on spring. So that is where we will start off. So let's start off with autumn. When we consider autumn in nature, it's a beautiful time, but it's also a time where dead things need to fall off. The leaves, even they were green, they go brown, they go dead, and they need to fall off. It's a time where if, if it does not happen, if, if the old things don't fall off in autumn, there cannot be a spring. Spring talks about new life, but and for us to see the new life, the old things need to die first. You cannot have spring without autumn. So the two are very closely connected. And there's another parable that, that speaks about this relationship between autumn and spring. It's the parable of the, of the wineskin in Luke chapter 5. Jesus 
mentions this parable of, about the new wine and the wineskins. I just would like to read that from verse 37, Luke 5, 37. And no one puts new wine into old wineskin. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins and, and, and it will be spilled and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. We are, we are longing for the new wine. We are longing for a greater degree of life. I know every one of you, myself included, we're longing for this new wine. But this new wine, this greater wine, this more wine, cannot fit into old wineskins. So there's change that is required. We need an autumn. Something needs to die, and we need, need a spring. Something new need, needs to happen. So I would like also to look at this morning about of some things that needs to die, things that needs to change. How do we change from an old wineskin into a new wineskin? The obvious one, the, the big one that needs to change is that we need to, to shed, need to drop off everything that is sinful, everything that is dishonoring to our king and master. That needs to fall off. Colossians 3 speaks about this, this falling off, this, this autumn time where we need to put off things. Colossians 3 verse 5. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. So these things need to fall off. And then now it gives a list of things that need to fall off in, in autumn. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, covetousness, idolatry. In verse 8, it actually continues with, with this list. And it talks about anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk. These are some of the things that need to fall, fall off. Spring, things need to come alive. Again in Colossians 3, from verse 12. Put on then. Let springtime come in these things. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. Now it makes, makes the list. Compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving one another, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. So when it comes to sin, we always must be in autumn time. We always must, must shed that what is fleshly, that what is, what is holding us back, that, those things that entangle us, they need to fall off. We never change out of a time of autumn when it comes to sin. On the other side, we always need to be in spring when it comes to, to love, to, the, to kindness, to meekness, to gentleness, to the fruits of the Spirit. We never need to move out out of spring. That needs to grow and needs to needs to stay in our lives. But this morning, I, I feel there's an emphasis on these two. And this is also this new season that we as a church is going into. I believe that this season of things falling off and things putting on are being highlighted. What is different now than six months ago? What, why is there a highlight on this issue, that we need to put these things off. And that is what I want to look at. I believe, and this is, this is the answer, I believe that we are going into a new season as a church and as individuals where we will experience and see a greater level of effectiveness, a greater level of fruitfulness, a greater level of power, greater level of anointing, and a greater level where the kingdom of God will be advanced. I believe God is taking us into this new season. And it's not by accident that for the last few weeks, actually last few months, we have been preaching on, on revival. After revival, we, 
You spoke about the Holy Spirit. We just finished on the Holy Spirit. It's not by accident. It's part of the preparation that God is busy taking us into this new season. And we as individuals need to prepare ourselves for this new season. We need to take this season seriously. When we consider Scripture, it seems for me as I read it, that a greater level of power, greater level of effectiveness, greater, greater level where the tangible presence of God is in our meetings, it requires also a greater level of holiness. A standard of holiness needs to increase as, as we're longing for these greater things. I want to tell you a story. Trying to illustrate our what I believe is our present level of holiness. Imagine there's a couple in the church. And this couple felt led by God to sell their property. And they were praying together one morning. God put it on their heart. Let's sell our property. But not only let us sell our property, let's give everything to God. They say to God, yes, we will do that. They put the house in the market or the property in the market. They sell it. The sale goes through. The money comes into their bank account. They look at the bank account and say, wow, this is a lot of money. And I'm 50 plus. My pension is not that good. I need some of that money. And then they, and they, and in their heart, they say, let's hold a little bit of this back. We will give it to God as we promised, but we will hold a little bit back. We will say no, say no one. We will just come in and give the the big amount to the church. How would we regard these people? I think with our present standard of holiness and our present standard, we would consider these people as heroes. We will honor them and think, wow, what have you done? Incredible Christians. Well, the same thing happened in Scripture, in Acts chapter 5. In Acts 2, there was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Believers were added to the church on a daily basis. There was incredible power. Peter walked, walked down the road. His shadow fell on people. People got healed just by his shadow. Incredible miracles, incredible power. Presence of God was incredible and big. And in this, we have a man called Ananias in Acts 5, verse 1. But a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only the part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? And to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these these words, he fell down, breathed his last And great fear came upon all who heard it. Ananias and Sapphira, they probably were praying together as the previous couple. Holy Spirit said to them, give this property. They said, yes. They made a vow in their heart. They made a promise to God and said, yes, I will give. And then they changed their vow. They came in there, they brought only a part And because they lied to God, because they broke their vow to God, what ended up was that they died. They were not, they didn't commit the unforgivable sin against the Holy Spirit. They were not unbelievers. They were Christians who heard the Holy Spirit speak. They made a promise. They made a vow. They failed to to fulfill their vow and they died. That was a standard of holiness and the consequences to to sin at that time. 
So when I consider this, and I look at my own life, I think sweat <laughs> starts to fall off my head. Because how many times have I myself made a promise to God and I did not keep my promise? There are times that God said to me, speak to that person about Christ today. And I said, yes, Lord. Today I will speak to that person about Christ. And then something happens. Fear comes into my heart. Fear of man comes into my heart. A lot of excuses come into my heart. And I do not fulfill what I said to God I will do. How many times in, in worship... God, I give you my all. I, then I make promises while I'm worshiping, and the next day I, I break those same promises. And when I consider Ananias, I said, God, have mercy upon me. Have mercy upon me. Don't treat me as my sins deserve. This is the standard of holiness and we as a church have prayed so many times for revival. So many times we say, God, pour out your spirit. We have a song uh, that I think as a, new, as a new person in the faith, if you hear the song, you actually don't know what the song is about. But it's, it's we sing and say, Lord, let it rain. Let it rain. Actually asking, Lord, let your, let your spirit pour out upon us. We have asked, asked it so many times. And when I consider the actual standards of holiness, of the place where if God would actually answer that prayer, then I wonder in my own heart, Lord, are we ready? Am I ready for this new revival, this new thing that I believe you, you want to do? If we want a greater anointing, if we want a greater presence of God, if we're longing for greater power manifestation of the Holy Spirit, it requires that we say yes to a new standard of holiness. And together with that new standard, standard of holiness comes also a new and an impact of the consequences of our sins that follow that. The two go hand in hand. Let me just explain something about the consequences of sin. According to 1 John 1 verse 9, if we say to God, God, I confess my sin, forgive. 1 John 1 verse 9 is clear. He takes all our unrighteousness away from us. We are clean. We also know that from Scripture that as, as young believers, when we say yes to Jesus as our Savior, that moment when we receive Jesus in our hearts as our Savior, something happens in, to us. He declares us righteous. He, see, he, sees you, he says you are clean. He says you are acceptable. You're a child of God. You're accepted by God. You're a saint in God's eye. You are perfect in God's eye. That happens the moment when you receive Jesus. And that's valid as long as you live. So at any point after that, when you die, you would go to heaven because the, the blood of Jesus Christ covers all sin. So we are forgiven. But it does not mean that when we sin, that the forgiveness, that means that there are no consequences to our sins. Hebrews 12, from verse, verse 6 to verse 11, speaks about the discipline of God. Hey, we're talking about heavy things this morning. Please don't cry. <laughs> but this is what I feel we need to talk about this morning. Hebrews 12 speaks about the discipline of God. And in verse 6 it says, God as our Father, the one who loves us as His children, because he loves us, will discipline us. And it goes on, and I think in verse, around verse 11, it says that this discipline, the consequences of our sin, the things that follow us, the, the painful things that happen to our lives that follow sin, 
we should view as discipline in God sees it as training into holiness, training into righteousness. It's not wrath. It's not anger of God. It's not like a so quiet for you. It's, it's, nothing, it's nothing of that. It is, I love you. I want you to drop those things. I, I'm seeing autumn. I want to see spring. You need to drop those things. And I'm helping you through the consequences of your sins that will follow. So, it sounds bad, but it's actually quite good. It's not nice, but it's good for us. I believe that God is preparing us as a people for this greater, greater outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We need to take these things seriously. We need to throw all those things that hinder, things that entangle us. God wants to do great things in our lives. But there's also another reason why we need to have an autumn time. There's, a, there's another reason why we need to drop off these fleshly sinful things. And we find that in 2 Timothy 2, verse 21. 2 Timothy 2, 21. Therefore, if everyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. God wants to use every one of us. That is the good news. God wants to use every one of us. But before he can use us, use us in his field, he needs that we clean the field of our own heart. And if God is using you already, and you say, God, use me more, it means our field in our hearts needs attention. There's things that need to change. There's a new wineskin. There's an autumn time required because God wants to use you. God wants to use me. The season that we as a church is going into requires that we cleanse ourselves because God had great things for us, great things for you, great things for me. Don't disqualify yourself. Let us not disqualify ourselves from being used because we don't want to do the cleansing work. We don't want to change. We love the wineskin, the old wineskin. God has so much more for us. It requires a new level of obedience to his word, it requires a great obedience to his Holy Spirit. And there's, there's one area I, I need to touch on. And it is the highest standard that is required with regards to sexual, sexual purity. I'm touching difficult things this morning. Ephesians 5 verse 3. The, the ESV puts it this way. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. But I like the NIV even more. The NIV says, but amongst you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality. Not even a hint of sexual immorality. Many people have come to me and when I was younger, I was, all, I was also thinking these things. The question I was, uh, that I asked myself is, and that people ask, many people ask, is where is the line with regards to sexual purity that I'm not allowed to cross? Because in our heart, we think, How, let me try to come as close as possible to that line, but I don't want to sin. Where is that line? Well, according to Ephesians 5 verse 3, it says, it's not the question is where is the line. What is more important is to stay away from that line as far as possible. Run away from that line. Do not come near it. Let there not be a hint of sexual immorality. This call to purity impacts our leisure time, impacts what we do with our eyes, impacts what we read, impacts what we, what we um, 
watch on TV, games we play, young people on your TV, it impacts everything we do. We are called to let it fall away. We are called to change, change your mind skin. This morning, in the area of sexual um, purity, if you are struggling with this area and you're not, not gaining victory, we had the, the, the prophecy earlier, God encouraging, there's victory for you, there's victory for you. We, we just had a, a team from um, here over the weekend, Project Exodus training how to help people to come into, into freedom number of facilitators that we have trained. So today, if you, if you say, but I'm struggling with this victory, do not accept it as a, as this is a weakness I'm struggling with, let me accept it for the rest of my life. No. Come and speak. Come and ask help. Bring it in the open. God wants you to have freedom. Today is a day of action. Don't, don't wait another moment. Get freedom. I need to explain another principle. We have spoken about raising the bar of, of holiness, high level of holiness. I just want to explain what I mean with that because that can easily be misinterpreted. I am not saying that we need to make for ourselves more rules and regulations. It does not mean that we have to say to ourselves, I'm... Um, I'm not going to put on makeup. I'm not going to wear skinny jeans. I don't have the body for skinny jeans. <laughs> I'd love to hair wear it, but I can't. <laughs> it, it's, it, it's not about when I come into church, I must be serious and, and, and look unhappy. It's not, it's not rules and regulation. When we say we, we're raising the bar of holiness, what we are speaking about is that we... We're talking about setting ourselves apart unto God for holiness. It means that we surrender our hearts and come in submission to God and say, Lord, here I am. I surrender my life to a new degree. Every area in my life I bring to you. Holy Spirit, speak, I will obey. I surrender my life to the leading of the Holy Spirit. That is, this is holiness. Holiness is not about what you leave. It's rather where you look at. It's putting your eyes on Jesus, putting your eyes on, on, on the Holy Spirit and following Him. It's not about rules and regulation. That's old covenant stuff. That's Moses stuff. Romans 7 verse 6 explains this. But now we are released from the law. This rules and regulation. We are released from that having died to what that which held us captive, so that we can serve in the new way of the Spirit, not in the old way of the written law. We are free from the law. We are free from rules and regulations. So let it go. Rather, let us be radical, radical in obedience to the Spirit's leading and to our revelation of Scripture. The written law of Moses brings bondage. It sucks the joy out of your life. But being led by the Spirit, walking in step with the Spirit, brings freedom, brings victory, brings life. I wish I could spend more time on this because this is such a passion of my heart, but I'm, I need to go on. So there's great wisdom. In your, if in, in your heart you say, I want to raise the bar of holiness. It's to say, yes, Lord, this is what I want to do. And then you come and surrender, and you sit at his feet, and you ask, Lord, what must I change? I open my whole life before you. Speak where you want to speak. I will address that issue. And then you are spirit-led. And God will speak. God will say, but this area... We need addressing here. That. Spend time with God at his feet. And that will help us to walk into this new holiness. I'm going to go to the next point. One of the biggest temptations 
of COVID-19, these restrictions that we're in, one of the biggest temptations is to isolate ourselves from, from people, from God. We become passive to the things of God. Passivity is such a big temptation. And it's those things that I, I feel this morning God is pressing his finger on. Say, this thing we need to address. If we have become passive, if we have neglected our relationship with God, if we have ne neglected the things of God, if we have neglected spending time with God and his people, if you have neglected fellowship, it is very difficult to change. And many people struggle to get out of it because they're waiting for this feeling to come. When I, when I feel I'm ready, when I feel it's right, then I would commit myself to Bible reading again. Then I'll, I'll commit myself to come to, to church again. We wait for this feeling, waiting for that moment to happen, waiting, I don't know, for the light to shine from heaven and the angels to sing. But generally, it, it doesn't happen. We need to make a world's decision, a decision irrespective of how we feel. And we say, this morning, I make the decision, I'm going to change. Despite all the arguments, I am going to draw close to God again and draw close to his people again. These are the, are the two things I believe that this COVID-19 has, has caused problems. It's that we have withdrawn from God and we have withdrawn from people. Our spiritual health, our well-being depends on us drawing close to God. If you have neglected your quiet time, your time of prayer, your time of Bible leading, the time that you spend alone with God, if you have neglected that, I want to encourage you strongly. Make the decision today to change. If your time of, that you spend time with God is in the mornings, let's, let's go pre-COVID. If, if you consider pre-COVID, when was a time that you spent time with God? If it was in the mornings, Many men do that before their families wake up. That's their time. If you're a businessman and you're very busy, that's probably the best time before everyone wakes up. If that is what you did in the past, then tonight, before you go to sleep, set your alarm for tomorrow morning. Don't wait for the feeling for tomorrow morning. It's not going to happen. You're going to oversleep. Because the devil wants to stop you. Your emotions will not be there. If you have small children, they probably will wake up in the night to keep you awake, that you have another excuse not to do your quiet time. Set your alarm, commit to that time. Even if it's so difficult, just start. Even if it's 10 minutes, don't have to go for an hour, two hours, three hours. Just start 10 minutes. Just, just get yourself into the habit again and then it, let it grow. The other one, is people. I want to encourage you, if you be, have been out of, out of fellowship, and fellowship has, has, has two areas. The one is church. So I'm not preaching now to you. I'm looking at, at the mic. I'm looking at the, the camera. If you have been at home for weeks and months and you have not considered seriously to come back to church, now is the time to consider that. If, if you have come to church, if, but you haven't gone the next step, it's being in fellowship with believers in the week, I want to seriously, strongly encourage you, go to a home group. If you don't know which home group to, to go to, at the back of the church, there's, there's a list of home group leaders. Connect and phone them even today. We need your fellowship. We need your fellowship. You need ours. Hebrews 10 verse 24. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and to good works, 
not neglecting, not neglecting to meet together, as is a habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as, it, as you see the day drawing near. We need your encouragement. We need your input into our lives. You need ours. Let's connect. If you have comorbidities under the COVID rules and you have someone in your family that is, that's, at, that's a high risk, I'm not saying throw out all wisdom. Be wise. But don't isolate yourself. Don't let fear hold you back from what God wants to do. Hear him, but be wise. Come into fellowship. Be wise. Let isolation and passivity fall of the tree in autumn time. I want to, let me quickly look at this. There's a man that battled with passivity in one part of his life, and it was, was David. David, we know the story of David. He, 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 he fell in adultery. Then he murdered her husband. But many times we forget where the story started. I want to go, go to the start of the story. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Job and his servants with him and all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. It was springtime. It was time for war. It was time for action. What David did, he stayed in Jerusalem, he isolated himself, and he went into passivity. Verse 2, it happened. It's amazing how that verse starts. It happened. What happened? Late one afternoon, when David arose from his couch, and he was walking on the roof of the king's house, he probably was walking there alone, because he was alone. What he saw from the roof was a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. The result was adultery, Continue the story, he killed her husband. And disaster happened. To safeguard ourselves against it happened. We cannot stay in passivity. We cannot stay in isolation. We are called to action. And the minimum things that we are called to action, these, these are the minimum things. Spend time with God. Read, read his word Spend time in prayer and do fellowship. That's the minimum all Christians should do. That's the actions we are required every day. Read your Bible, pray every day. There's a song that the kids sing. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> well, it chase me away from children's church if I do that. But that is the basics to keep us strong. Let me close with this thing. God has great victories for us as a church. He has the, the works that he has for us as a church is preset. He has great plans for us. There's a new season. There's new life he wants to bring us into. But we need to, to prepare. There's things that we need to do. There's things in autumn time that we need to drop off. There's things in springtime that we need to put, put on. As a minimum, read your Bible, pray every day, come back to fellowship. And together with that, be sensitive to His Spirit. Let His Spirit show you the things that need to fall off. Walk with His Spirit. God has great things, great victories for all of us. Let's pray. Lord, we, we consider the future. We, we have such an expectation of the future, Lord, for the new thing that you want to do, the new season that you are taking us into. Lord, there's excitement in my heart. There's, 
when I speak to my fellow elders, Lord, there's an expectation of something great, something new. Lord, and we want to say, we want to walk with you into this new season. We want to prepare our hearts for this new season. Lord, I want to ask that you would help each one of us in this autumn time that, we, that we're walking into to throw off everything that's needed. Help us to, to take holiness seriously. Lord, we don't want to play with sin. We want to be serious about the things of God. Help us to put on those things that we need to be strong, to prepare ourselves. Lord, those who are struggling to come out of passivity, I want to pray, especially for them, Lord. Help them today to make, get a breakthrough. Spend time with you. Spend time in your word. Make their prayer life alive, Lord. And help them to come back into fellowship. Yes, Lord, thank you for, for the great things you want to do. What we as a church want to say, here we are. Help us to prepare. Amen. Today, if you are here, and maybe if you're listening this over social media, and you, and you look at your own life and say, but I'm in winter. I'm dead. There's no life. You say, but I long for this life of, in Jesus Christ. I long for to walk with God, to be, in, to be with His Spirit, to, to have this, for a springtime to come into my life and let it, let it new life to burst forth. If that is you, if you feel you're dead, I want to pray for you. Maybe you walked away from God and you want to come back. Maybe you have never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Say, but I, I'm dead. Today I want to be alive. Then pray this prayer with me. Before I do that, I just want to explain to you what I'm going to pray. The first thing I'm going to pray is acknowledge that Jesus is the answer. Acknowledge who he is. And then we're going to invite him to come into our lives with his spirit and bring life into our hearts. Salvation prayer. Lord, I'm going to pray. Lord, I, I look at my life. I'm dead. Lord, there's no life. I long for the life. I long for Jesus to be in my life. I long for the Holy Spirit to make me alive. This morning, I acknowledge that Jesus is the answer. I acknowledge that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. I acknowledge that he rose again on the third day. I hear the knocking at the door, and this morning I open my heart, and I say, Jesus, come into my life as my Lord, as my Savior, as my Master, and as my King. Amen. If you have done that, if you have prayed that, John 1 verse 12 says, everyone who has acknowledged him, everyone who has believed on his name, everyone who has received him, he gave the right to be called children of God. And he puts his spirit within you, and from this moment you will see new life springing forth. Is there anyone who has prayed this prayer here in this hall? We would love to, to celebrate this moment with you. Is there anyone? Maybe just put, put up your hand. We just want to give... God, a, a clap. Is there anyone? I didn't see any hands. If you're watching this over social media, if you have prayed that prayer, tell someone today what you have made. Amen. God bless you. May you have a wonderful week. May autumn season be effective. We drop things but more than that, may you experience spring in just a great new way this week. God bless you. Amen.